the shore, and then the guy's using you because of your height and strength to climb up you as a ladder to get out. Like that ladder, Steve. You've helped many people to the top. Well done, Steve. Thank you, Mike. Your Olympic success story began with Mike Spracklin at Los Angeles in 1984 when with Martin Cross, Richard Budget, Andrew Holmes and Adrian Ellison you won the Coxed Fours. Here you are in action on a misty day on Lake Casitas, California. They've now got 20 metres to go and Britain are going to win the gold. Britain first, the United States second, they cross the line now and there is gold for Great Britain. Now, two of the crew that rode to that thrilling victory have emerged from the mist to join us tonight. Martin Cross and Richard Budget. <laughs> now, that was, uh, that was a famous victory, Martin, but Steve nearly missed out, didn't he? Yes, that's right, and all on account of him trying to lose the boredom of the week we had to wait in between winning the heat and the final. In uh, Los Angeles he tried to win the Electronic Olympics and it was this little uh, machine that you could play for free in the village and it involved trying to make a little electronic athlete run very fast by going da -da 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 <laughs> with his finger and then he began to complain that he couldn't perhaps hold the oar properly but luckily we had a doctor in the boat. <laughs> yes. I had to ask Steve to uh, concentrate on winning the real gold medal rather than an electronic gold medal <laughs> and um, we get a lot of tinnitus synovitis of the wrist in Oarsman but I've never seen a case before of Tina Sinovitis, the finger. And fortunately, he hasn't had it since, and neither has any other rower. <laughs> Good news. Thank you both very much. Well, in spite of Tina Sinovitis, um, <laughs> rowers are among the fittest people in sport. But in 1985, when you joined Ian Botham on his epic charity march from John O'Groats to Land's End, it tested even your strength to the limit. Let's hear from the man who marched at your side for 112 miles, Ian Botham. Steve, I hope you're having a great evening. You deserve it. Many congratulations on that tremendous record at the Olympics. It couldn't have happened to a nicer guy or a med more dedicated guy. As you remember, when you came on the walk, Steve, a few years ago, and the walk from John O'Groats to Land's End, you had rather sore feet, as I recall. But typically of yourself, you gutsed it out. But what we've done, Steve, for the next walk, we've had something specially made for you. I think they're the right size. <laughs> Have a great evening. See you soon. Thank you, Ian. In 1987, you receive an MBE in the New Year's Honours, and a year later, on March the 12th, 1988, more honours, you and Anne were married in the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral. Getting you to the church on time was a feat in itself. Your friends marked the end of your bachelor status with a marathon stag do. It lasted 36 hours, including a trip to Paris, with Steve wearing leg irons and handcuffs. <laughs> One of the walking wounded from that party, Roger Hatfield. <laughs> Roger, why, why the handcuffs? Did Steve go berserk? Um, well, he's a big lad and we thought we might have to keep him under some sort of control, obviously. Um, we decided to play golf during the day at one of our local courses and we'd hidden champagne in a few of the bunkers. And the idea was that if you missed a few putts, then you had to sink a few glasses of champagne. Steve, unfortunately, missed a lot of putts. Not as many, not as, many as you did. Very true. <laughs> But I was trying to help you out there. Um, and unfortunately, at the end of the game, we were well over par and distinctly under par because of the booze, if you remember. So, an excellent day. Happy memories. Thank you very much, Roger. <laughs> well, by the end of that epic golf match, you and your mates were all struggling to hit the ball in one, let alone sink it. But here is someone who never has that problem, Nick Faldo. What did you think of that one, Steve? One of my better strokes. Well, a lady once spoke to a very famous violinist, I can't pronounce his name, after a concert, and said, I'd, I'd give my life to be able to play like that. And he simply said, I did. And I think you fall very much into that category where you've certainly given and committed yourself totally to your sport, which has brought you all those, those goals, but you left no stone unturned in your pursuit, becoming the, the fastest, the best, and, and now the greatest. So congratulations on that. Uh, I hear the golf is coming on well, so 
I better go off and practice my stroke. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Now, Anne, with all Steve's worldwide success, there is one thing he finds difficult, and that's signing autographs. It is indeed. Unfortunately, Steve's been dyslexic, or is dyslexic, and that means that he has problems trying to write quickly. And, of course, when you're put on the spot with autographs, people ask you to write their names. That's a particular problem. Well, one of the many people who understands that problem is actress Susan Hampshire, and she sends you this message. Hi, Steve. Hello, Michael. I just want to thank you for being so kind and telling your story and how you overcame dyslexia for my book, Every Letter Counts. It's really meant so much to all the dyslexic people. It's been a great inspiration to them and indeed to all the athletes. Well done. And give my love to Anne. Bye. Thank you, Susan. At the Seoul Olympics in 1988, you win your second Olympic gold with Andy Holmes. And then after being forced to row two gruelling heats in the space of one hour, you win an heroic bronze in the coxed pairs event. I was the coxed, but for several weeks I had to play second fiddle to a toolbox. That sounds interesting. Flown in from San Francisco, Patrick Sweeney. <laughs> Would you mind standing next to me for quite a while? Okay. Oh, what a relief. Now, tell us more, Patrick. Well, I couldn't make the initial early training sessions with Steve and Andy, so what they did is they put a toolbox to keep the boat balanced until I could arrive. One of the troubles was that Steve preferred the toolbox. Uh, he said that, one, it made the boat balance better, and it also didn't shout and abuse him. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve, at Seoul, you met your hero, the brilliant single scholar from Finland, Perti Karpinen. Here he is, winning his third Olympic title at Los Angeles in 1984, the games where you won your first gold. It looks as though Karpinen has judged it once again. Perti just failed in his bid to win four consecutive gold medals in Seoul, but he had great words of encouragement for you. But, uh, I, I remember the, uh, um, going for the third with Matthew at Barcelona, and the morning we walked down towards the lake, uh, he came up to us and wished us good luck and uh, but, uh, gave us great confidence and a great honour for such an ambassador of the sport as, as he has been. Well, in spite of his encouraging words, after Seoul, your own fourth goal seems unlikely. Your partnership with Andy Holmes ends when he suddenly decides he's had enough. Was that a great disappointment to you? I think that uh, with Andy and I that uh, we'd set ourselves some great targets and uh, our ambition was to try and win two goals at one game and we just failed on that. But we knew for a long time that uh, Andy was going to walk away from that and uh, I wasn't quite sure of what direction I was going to go in. So it wasn't a big surprise, but uh, um, all great pairs have to come to an end. Well, you make a pair with Simon Beresford and with him you win silver at the 1989 World Championships. But unfortunately, Simon injures his back in a boat accident and that puts an end to that partnership. By 1991, you're rowing with Matthew Pinsent and you join up with the new coach, Jürgen Grobler. Training for rowing is notoriously tough, but Jürgen makes it even tougher. If you're not 100% or not quite up to fitness, then the, you won't last, and that hurts even more. As if uh, training wasn't difficult enough, in the build-up to Barcelona, your third gold medal was put in jeopardy by serious illness. You pick up a bug while training in South Africa. It's diagnosed as ulcerated colitis. You become diabetic and have to inject yourself daily with insulin. And you're going to, at one stage, you were worried that Steve might not even reach the Olympic final, weren't you? Yes, it was uh, quite a difficult situation ten weeks before the Olympics. We had to stop and change our program because Steve was really weak, was very ill. So Matthew was carrying on the full program and we have done a special program for Steve. And after four, five weeks, he was back to form. And then we carried on in the last five weeks to make uh, the Olympic Games in Barcelona. I think at that time he really shows he's a very hard, very tough guy. I think that shows makes champion. Thank you. 
In the Coxless Pairs at Barcelona, you and Matthew defend your title like true champions. And after remaining unbeaten in 56 consecutive races, you go to Atlanta not only as red-hot favourites, but you are the standard bearer for Great Britain. Great Britain, led by Steve Redgrave. Three times rowing gold medalist in the last three of Olympics, going for a record four. And tonight, carrying the Union Jack for the second time at Olympic Games, the only Briton ever to do so. Well, a proud moment there, watched not only by your family, but by one of your great fans, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, herself a competitor at the Montreal Olympics in 1976. Now, when she heard about tonight's celebration, she sent a personal message, which, uh, if you don't mind, I'll quote at you. Uh, congratulations on winning your fourth gold medal, a success born of total commitment, talent and sheer hard work. Can I also thank you for all the extra time you've given to helping other athletes become Olympians. You've been an example to us all, but I sincerely hope that you will continue to be one in the future, perhaps in a slightly different role, question mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> My very best wishes to you and your family. Signed, Anne. Now, in, spite, in spite of all the celebrations, your triumph at Atlanta caused problems for one of your best friends. He was a member of the same woodwork class with you at school. He made a presentation box for your previous Olympic medals, but it wasn't big enough for another one. Ian Desmond. Hello, Steve. Remember before Atlanta, I offered to make you a new presentation box for your medals. You said not in your life, because that's tempting fate. Now that you've got your hands safely on that fourth gold medal, as you can see, I'm finishing off a completely new box. Well, he's finished it now, and he's here to present it, Ian Desmond. Hello, Ray. All right? Hello. How are you? Thank you. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Well, that is quite magnificent, but it's not quite all, Steve. At the Seoul Olympics eight years ago, you met the man you'd always idolised, the man who predicted you would become the greatest rower in Olympic history. Well, we've flown him in from Finland to say, I told you so, Perti Karpinen. <laughs> I knew could do it. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> That's Thank it. You very much. Steve Redgrave, this is your life. Steve Redgrave will be in the hot seat on Live and Kicking tomorrow morning on BBC One. Next tonight, Keeping Up Appearances.